Here we go. We're going to go, go through some uh, landslide risk and risk considerations um, in looking at um, concrete earthen embankments and other type structures. So we're going to basically summarize landslide classifications. We're going to evaluate risk landslides posed to structures, rivers, and reservoirs. So here's uh, some of the landslides, uh, potential areas on the right. Um, and many, uh, many dams are in mountainous areas um, where landslides are common. Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't include uh, some of our Alaska. That, that has uh, a lot of landslide areas as well. Uh, they're both direct and indirect imp impacts due to uh, landslides. And um, always look beyond the footprint of the facility, i.e. Vion and Quake Lake. Um, those are two examples that we'll cover later on. But um, in regards to direct impacts, you can have slides that hit the spillway structures or slides that hit the retaining uh, the gates on the spillway structures. You can also um, have slides that hit the reservoir or create a siege wave. Um, so there's, and then indirect, you can have earthquakes that trigger slides and also damage the concrete structure. And then you have to start worrying about, you know, cracks, uh, internal erosion along cracks or, or, or other issues like that. So some of those are some of the direct impacts. And then always look beyond the facility footprint. Um, so it's not just around the dam, but it could be way upstream. Or, um, yeah, upstream is typically the main concern, but some, you can have some effects downstream as well. Uh, so this is Gross River, uh, Colorado. Um, this is a slide that you can see Bonneville Dam there. Um, here's the theoretical unstable abutments on the right. You can see the dipping um, strata upstream of the reservoir. Yeah, this would be a reactive or a new slide. Yeah, the landslide and the new instability can be, be triggered by the change in the hydrostatic conditions created by a dam, uh, the raise of the reservoir, or the operations of a dam, or the seismic event that triggers the old slide, and or precipitation, changing of the, uh, the weight on the slope. So all these can happen in combination. So um, you got to look at many things when you're looking at the triggering of slides. Uh, impact of landslide on location. Um, this is the oh, this is a, a, a project Todd Moore worked on. This was a reactivation of a slide that they built the land the dam on. And you can see the general direction up here on the right. You can see the, the, the landslide movement. And then when the um, when they had all that loading and the reservoir got fully loaded, it started reactivating the slide. So everything was kind of moving <laughs> in addition to the uh, spillway eroding back at the same time. But the abutment, the abutment um, was an old landslide. Um, and it can lower a crest, the crest height if it moves and create cracking, which can initiate scour and concentrated leak erosion and or concrete deformation and cracking. Um, around the dam site, the spillway can be blocked. It can hinder reservoir release operations and it can continue with continued deformation of the spillway. Uh, relic slides and deposits of the dam filmmaker information and stability of internal erosion failure mode. This, this had a combination of both because they had a sp uh, spillway erosion um, at <laughs> Guajataca Dam. Oh, I pronounced it right. So the, the spillway was eroding back and they also had the dam move, moving due to the uh, high reservoir levels created by the uh, so um these are landslide-related failure modes upstream and in the reservoir. Um, this is at the Zinc 
Who Reservoir in Sichuan, China, in 2008. Um, if you have the uh, landslide upstream, um, you can have rapid failure, and if you create a wave, a siege wave, or a large, fast-moving wave close to the dam and over top the dam, the dam can remain perfectly intact and stable, but you know they have a huge overtopping event, and downstream you have life loss and, and damage. Um, you can also have damage downstream, blockage, and create a debris dam, um, which affects the access and monitoring and outlet releases of the dam. Um, I know in, a, in Alaska, one of our projects, uh, Lowell Creek Dam and Tunnel, they had a uh, landslide issue in regards to triggered by earthquakes and then that would create a reservoir upstream and impact both structures if that land mass failed rapidly. So that was one of the failure mode considerations for that project. Here's one, uh, Viant Dam that I think everyone's probably heard of or familiar with. Um, it was an 870 foot arch dam in Viant River near Lagaron, Italy, completed in 1960. The foundation and reservoir slopes were composed of bedded karstic limestone uh, that is folded and faulted. You can see over here on the on the right the uh, ancient land mass comprised the left abutment. Um, the left bank, uh, yeah, consisted of an old slide mass from post glacial period. Um, it wasn't thought to be an issue by designers, so it was recognized. You see the picture of the dam on the, the lower right. I mean, that's a pretty impressive structure. Um, so a part of the left bank slid into the reservoir on November 4th, 1960. It was a total failure. Instrumentation and monitoring indicated. Um, October 1993, a massive slide occurred, filled the entire reservoir for a mile upstream of the dam, creating a huge wave. The sliding occurred on a previous sheared clay filled bedding plane with a feed angle of 10 to 20 degrees with a dip of 35 plus to minus 10 degrees. It, it was estimated the slide occurred in about 20 to 30 meters a second and was accelerating and at approximately 350 million cubic yards of material were displaced, creating an 850 foot wave up the right bank. And that is just colossal. Amazing. Like the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding down your valley. And so here's what happened. Um, there were 2,600 fatalities in the village of Lagaron downstream. The slide sent a wall of water 330 feet high over atop the dam. And the dam survived. The dam was still in place. But you can see the before and after effects of the, uh, what happened in the valley. So after a definitive study by Hendron and Patton was done in 1995, they came to the conclusion that this occurred on an old slide and it was moved on a weak, uh, previously sheared clay layer with a fee angle of about 12 degrees that dipped towards the valley. You can see the sheared layer on the right. Um, Hendron and Patton did some studies in this outside the slide area, but it, they confirmed a similar sequence, um, geologic sequence in the reservoir area. Um, the kicker was um, the groundwater system in combination with the uh, geology. On the karstic terrain, you had a lot of inflow and uh, infiltration, and when they raised the reservoir at the toe, it changed the groundwater conditions of the whole left abutment. So they had some unintended consequences. Um, and you can, I'll show you some plots here that illustrate uh, what happened. So here's the reservoir loading. What's interesting about this is um, you can see the reservoir loading and it increases, increases, increases. And you see when it hits 5,000, it drops. The reservoir is dropping, dropping, and then you have the rainfall event. 
and it jumps back up. So it loads back up to 5,000, but it happens really quickly. Now, basically what happened is the reservoir had already been at 5,000, but they had been raising it, and um, then they lowered it, and uh, then they had a rapid rainfall event, and that the combination of the rapid rainfall with the rapid rising basically triggered it. And I'll show you how. Um, so before you can see here the movement, um, you can see reservoir elevation and then precipitation. And then here a lower precipitation with low reservoir, low precipitation, they could raise it and it wouldn't fail. However, on the right, if you exceed this envelope on the right with high precipitation and a high reservoir, you get rapid movement. And that's, and this was all modeled. And this is the failure slope basically triggered. So basically what happened is the groundwater rose rapidly as the, la as the land mass loaded also was heavy and the groundwater hit that clay layer, that sheared layer and kind of had nowhere to go and it was an additional force that basically triggered the release and slide. Um, <laughs> it's Wango, Colombia. I, I was here. I was at this one. I witnessed it. So um, it's important to understand um, all sorts of different aspects of the, of the slide, how it occurs and how it's going to impact operations. Um, you need to look at reservoir operations, groundwater conditions and response. You have to look at the geology, including 3D effects. Um, you have to look at the geometry of the failure mechanism. The slide characteristic, is it a, is it a mass slide? Is, where's the rupture surface? Are there lateral margins and are they likely to increase in size? Um, this is a good example here. You can see that the initial slide started off down here upstream of the facility, right near the intakes. Um, they were trying to unplug one of their, ex at, they, had, they had like three intakes here and they, were, they had blocked one during construction. They were trying to unplug it and they used explosives and that triggered a slide. And so it triggered a tunnel collapse and it triggered a, like a big pressure pulse through the system and started a slide. And, and these are all at basically at all the slopes around there are at the angle of repose. Um, so once you steepen the slope, you have these rapid landmass slides that just start going and they blocked the intake for all the tunnels. So now they had no way to bypass the dam and the dam's under construction. So um, as this slide grew, you can see other tunnels collapsed inside the, la the right abutment. And you can see the scar face, scarp face starting to grow. And it was, uh, I think I, I discovered this when I went up and looked for it three, uh, three, four days after we had got there. And so this whole landmass was moving towards the valley and reservoir, which was rapidly filling. And here's the spillway structure. It would have taken out all the spillway gates. Um, we were actually right across the slide. They put us right here uh, on the left abutment. And uh, when this really started going, I asked to be moved, our whole team to be moved upstream and out of harm's way. So um, once we started looking at these slides, in the slide history in the area, you could see remnant slides everywhere, all over the place. And, you know, the, the Colombian geologists that were there were telling me, no slide, all good, all good. And then, you know, start looking and they're, they're everywhere. This, this was not a stable. There were three faults that went right through here and it was not a great place to put a dam. Um, so that was a very interesting project that we did back in 2019. Wow. But three, four years. I thought it was 2018, but um, maybe this is a year after. But they, they ended up lowering this whole mountainside on the right to stop this mass movement. And uh, I wish I had more recent pictures. So again, um, you have to. When we were looking at all the aerial photos and stuff while we were there in Colombia, you could see these mass movements characteristics and uh they're up in the upper left these you can see the scarp face and the steep face followed by these hummocky terrains and little relic scarp movements these are indicative of of mass movements and slides 
and and if you look at old topography maps or old um, satellite photos or current photos um, or current Google imagery, uh, and you see those, you know you're in a mass movement area. Um, here's some of the other topographic expression and contours on the lower left, and here's some of the more um, um, relevant ones on the right. So you, they um, the ground, so the topographic contours, surface expressions, and ground textures expressed in the shaded relief surveys reveal previous deformations and displacements. Here's some key landslide characteristics. This is a, a lot of, you can go to the landslide hazard program and uh, maps at the USGS. It's down in the uh, lower left-hand corner of the slide. I encourage you to visit the site and you can actually zoom in to different locations and they can give you here are these landslide hazard maps. And if they're near your site, you can take a look at how they impact your reservoirs. I know in the Pacific Northwest, I've uh, worked on a lot, like Lookout Point, Dexter Dam. There's a number of dams up there that have had landslide issues in and around the reservoir. Um, so these, these can be common uh, depending where you are. This is a good site to visit. I encourage you after this uh, talk to go visit. Um, this is Quake Lake and Madison Canyon landslides. They were triggered by a uh, earthquake, mass wasting landslide down down here. You can see it on the right. It was a magnitude 7.5 to 7.8, and it blocked part of the Yellowstone Park. There was a uh, 43 million cubic yards slid across the canyon and up the opposite side uh, and 27 fatalities occurred in the campground on the opposite side of the river. So here's, um, here's a, the geology of the site. You can see the area of the slide um, here in the middle. Um, you can see the area of the earthquake, and up here, up near Hebron Lake, that's the epicenter. Oh, that's the dam, sorry. The earthquake was right nearby. Um, and then the quake slide, oh, the epicenter is right here in the octagon, and the quake slide occurred downstream, and there's the dam. And then this was, this was the big mass movement, was right over here. So uh, you have basalt indicated in yellow. Um, you have a caldera deposit, some volcanics indicated in the orange, and then you have within the caldera the the, the volcanic deposits. Here is the Quake Lake landslide. Um, this one this this occurred along the foliation, fifty degree foliation, toward the canyon. Uh, the buttress was formed by uh, dolomite, and you can see the what it looked like prior in the landslide scar. But when this occurred, um, basically, you, the driving force broke this buttress of, of jointed dolomite, and when it collapsed, it just the whole slide just went. You can see upstream. This was uh, immediately after the slide. These two slides. See the whole, the left is the whole mass movement. There's the scarp on way on the right on the first slot picture, moved across the valley, and then here is looking the other way or climbing up the mass movement. So the landslide debris created a, a dam that was 4,000 feet long and 200 feet high across the Madison River. Um, it formed Quake Lake. And it was leaking at uh, 200 cubic feet a second, not much. Uh, Hebgen Lake, nearly full at the time, was damaged by the earthquake. Um, the volume of Hebgen Lake, nearly four times of which could be accommodated by Quake Lake. Uh, in time, it, they basically created a spillway notch to allow it to drain freely um, without collapse and dramatically failing. Um, and then they also armored it. Um, so it became more of a permanent structure. Here you can see they basically hired a consulting board, which included Arthur Casagrande, 
they needed to lower the crest to reduce the gradient and pool through the um, deposit so it wouldn't wouldn't create like internal erosion inside the deposit. Um, they lowered it 50 feet to reduce Quake Lake from about 1,800 cubic, 18,000 cubic acre, acre feet to 35,000 acre feet. And they used flowing water to aid with the uh, excavation of the, uh, the spillway, but it kind of got away from them. So they had to redirect flow and end dump a bunch of gravel and large material to kind of slow the erosion. Because Mother Nature does things faster than we plan. So here's a database of earthquake-induced landslides. You can see them all here. Um, here's a paper here on the left that is referenced. Earthquake triggered rock, rock slope failures. Um, and there's a summary of all these referenced in the paper. Um, here's Libby Dam. They did a three-dimensional rock wedge analysis on Libby Dam. They're I think they're still currently doing that analysis. And they're trying to determine if an earthquake is going to trigger a slide movement on that. Um, I am not working on that project, but I do know that the New England cadre and Todd Lore are. But they're basically evaluating how large an earthquake and whether this this large rock block can move to have this concrete dam fail we'll have a catastrophic failure of the left abutment. Um, you can also have uh, dams that are founded on landslides. This is a Costella Dam in New Mexico, and here's one San Francis Dam in uh, California. Um, we also have one. Uh, I think Howard Hansen Dam is founded on a landslide as well, if I remember correctly. They have a couple drainage tunnels through the right abutment to drain the, the pressures in the old landslide material. I think they're going to be putting a tunnel through that as well in the near future. Um, but Costella Dam in New Mexico, um, you can see the, the right abutment is um, has an old landslide scarp, and they you can see by the valley, they basically put it there because it pinched uh, the valley narrowed, and that was the old landslide scarp. Uh, during construction, the uh, contractor was moving materials and loaded that, that old landslide slope. And uh, when they started cutting the toe of it for construction of the dam, it triggered movement. Um, St. Francis Dam um, was along a ancient fault or slip. Um, in some schistose rock, which was dipping at 50 degrees, and it triggered, uh, that triggered and moved during quake, and see the block movement in the, in the depiction in the center. And you can see the uh, remnants of St. Francis Dam on the far left. You can also have uh, rock slides that do damage to structures. Um, this, these are the spillway gates that got damaged by a rock slide. These are typically near, like concrete dams are, are, are perched within or narrow canyon, canyon type spaces. So you can have rock slides above, above the dam that come down on the dam itself or uh, at per, pertinent structures. So um, takeaway points, the mechanisms for landslide, you can tr trigger, you know, along old seismic or old, uh, landslides, and they can be triggered by um, loading of the slope via rain and precipitation. They can be triggered by earthquake movement. They can um, be triggered by, you know, construction activities and loading of the slope. Um, they can be, you know, reactivated along old slide planes, or they can be new slide planes. So, but the key is there has to be something that's changing the slope dynamic and the loading that triggers it to move. Um, the location of the landslide impacts the risks. Upstream, you can have a large wave that creates overtopping the dam. Downstream, it may hinder operations and access to the dam. Um, so you can have different levels of danger in either operation. Both inhibit the dam, but 
Some are immediate life loss and some are um, access related. Um, look outside of the dam footprint upstream of the dam. Uh, Viant is the example for that one. Uh, upstream can cause river reservoir waves. Downstream can cause debris dams, inundate the operating structures or block access. And then the abutments or foundations can cause damage to the structures or embankment stability and then thus cause catastrophic release. So uh, the abutment analysis is very important as well. Mechanisms for triggering landslides, again, are related typically to seismic or hydrogeologic or hydraulic loading. Here's some additional references that are um, very useful. You can get uh, landslide investigation and mitigation, special report, uh, the landslide dams, process risk and mitigation, and then landslide analysis and control, and then a report on the analysis of rapid natural rock slope failures. Um, questions? What other questions do we have for Tom? Yeah, let me uh, stop sharing so I can see it. <laughs> Tom, I have a question. This is Carolyn Pearson. Sure. Um, you'd mentioned on some of your earlier slides um, a large uh, impulse wave caused by the landslide flowing into the, the base, the reservoir, I guess. Um, is that the same as a sage wave, or is that a, a different, is a sage wave a different mechanism? Because we talked about that in a previous lecture this week. Well, Seish waves, um, by definition, are basically standing waves set up on rivers or reservoirs or enclosed water bodies um, on a different harmonic period than their natural one. And uh, they're in direct contrast to tsunamis created by large displacements underwater, which create the wave. Um, so, yeah, they are different. But seismic seizures are basically standing waves that can, that can move um, or can be created by the harmonic of the seismic waves running through the mediums. But, you know, typically what happens is the oldest ones that I've seen, at least in Etwango, that was triggered by man-made activity, and they did it on an already stable slope, and it just magnified. They already had loaded the whole tow um, and changed the tow and cut off uh, the buttress, the natural buttress that was there, and then it loaded, changed the whole hydraulic condition, and then triggered it with an explosion. So it's like the worst thing you could do, and then the whole thing collapsed all and around, and everything just started moving. So then, then we were wait, we were waiting for you know a wave created by a slide into the reservoir. Prior to that, I don't think they had ever considered that. So the, that so the slide is causing that um, the large the large wave, not necessarily the standing wave. Right. The slide would create the large wave, but that's more of a displacement wave. Uh, whereas a seash wave, by definition, is is caused by the harmonic or or by the motion of the earthquake, and and the harmonic of the waves passing through the water body, the enclosed water body. So there is a difference. I got a question. Yeah, sure. Shoot. Geologic related, not landslide related, but um, curious on your um, experience dealing with areas that are prone to sinkholes. And from a geologic risk perspective, you know, you may not have something directly known within the footprint, but in in the pool area or in that, you know, think in Florida in particular, um, how you guys deal with that or what resources are out there for looking at those areas that may be prone to sinkholes? Oh, first, um, yeah, you can, you can do that. You, first you'd look at your USGS maps, um, and they have those pretty well demarcated in regards to karst topography. Look at particular, 
um, formations, rock units that are pervasive and known to be karst. Um, I would look at the regional fracture patterns. It would probably be pretty well eroded out if it's highly karst. We have, we've had we have a number of dams in, in karst environments, um, and they did some dam treatment in the abutments prior to putting the dams there, um, filling large voids and 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 the like. Wolf Creek Dam is one that comes to mind. They had to put a cutoff wall in recently on that one, but um, yeah, I would mainly look at look at the rock units, look at the historic photos prior to the dam and construction, see where the units intersect uh, at different elevations, and then they probably have a lot of geology on or historic information on those units. Um, in the local geologic information, you can find it in the usually in the in the dam write-ups as well, in, in that the core does. But you can find extensive information outside the uh, the the core documents as well. But karst is pretty common, um, and we I, I'm think I can think about what, Center Hill. There's we have a bunch of dams with karst issues. I think Rough River is going to be dealing with some of that in regards to the tunneling and some of that uh, in the near future. Lacinawa, I mean, wherever we put a cutoff wall recently is because of karst. So, yeah. at least in most of the dams. So, I hope All that right. answers right. your question. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yep. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>